Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to That's So Fringy podcast. It's just me this week. I'm your host, Rick, and uh, I'm going to be interviewing a guy by the name of Tim Moon this week. And uh, we get into some interesting stuff. We talk about his book, Tomato Fields, and uh, he's just an interesting guy all around. We really had a good conversation. Uh, the reason that Kristen and Bethany are not here this week is because they have the Scandinavian Festival going on this week. And due to the fact that they're both Norwegian women, they uh, are participating in that. So uh, it's a good time for the whole community. And uh, we have a good time doing it. So that's what they're off doing. I'm here uh, running the podcast studio for today. Um, but we really hope that you enjoy listening to our friend Tim Moon, who is a crypto zoo novelist who wrote a really cool book and is fascinated with cryptids. So uh, if you don't know what that is, stay tuned. We'll get into it. Hope you guys are doing good. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and uh, pass this video on to anybody that you desire to hear it. You think somebody would like this message, somebody would like this content, send it over to them. We are having a good time. We hope you are too. Um, smash those like buttons, subscribe. Don't forget if you're on Apple, uh, you're not going to be able to see us on video, but you'll be able to uh, see us on Spotify, also on YouTube. And if you head over to our website, there's lots of cool things on there. Like we just put out a new show notes section and that show notes section is going to have all of our um, links and videos and things that we reference in the show. So if you haven't seen that page, go ahead and check that out. And uh, yeah, I think that's all I got. So with that, we're going to get into the episode. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome with me, Tim Moon. Gentlemen, welcome back to That's So Fringy podcast. I'm here with the author, Tim Moon. He uh, authored a book by the name of Tomato Fields, and we're so excited to have him on today. We've heard him on several other podcasts and uh, listened to um, other people talk to him, and we enjoyed the conversation they were having, so we wanted to have one as well and introduce you to uh, our audience, Tim. So how are you doing today, man? Hey, I'm great. Had a good day. Thank That's you. That's awesome. Yeah, so glad to hear. So uh, glad to finally meet you in person or uh, on screen, I should say. And uh, we'll get into uh, I just want to know a little bit about your background, because I know that you're you're pretty heavily in the cryptid space. Uh, first of all, for those in our audience that don't understand what a cryptid is, could you go into that a little bit and then maybe talk about how you got into this space and what yeah, led I, you down that road? Yeah, a cryptid, as I understand it, is just uh animals that are rumored or mythologically rumored to exist um, mm -hmm. with some evidence for their existence, but a lot of mystery too. And since they're not in the zoo, uh, some people believe that they exist uh, and some people believe they do not. Yeah. And uh, they, they're just referred to as cryptid and, and Bigfoot's one of those okay. uh, along yep. with numerous other uh, animals and creatures. Um, and I've just had a, a fascination with that particular cryptid my, most of my life. I, uh, I saw the movie, uh, legend of Boggy Creek. I don't know if you've heard of that, but I don't think I've seen it. Oh, you got to see it. That's okay. it. You just got to see that. It's a, it's a cult movie. Now it was, it was like very low budget filmed off and really low budget and it did really well and wow and it still makes good money i think um but it's oh. about a, a experience these kids have with bigfoot not kids they're adults but they're young adults and sure. have with bigfoot in arkansas uh, uh, around bogey creek and it scared me it really scared me but it also intrigued me and and from then on i thought there's probably something to this and i was not discounting it and so every time i would be in a place where someone might ha know something about this like in a hunting store or, mm. you know or going hunting or talking to hikers and i would ask if you know if they've ever had any weird experiences and i've had a number of them come tell me some weird experiences so it's just always fascinated me uh since since watching that movie yeah. in the 70s and um, 
then I began to study it as a historian. About 20 years ago, I just got, it went from being just a curious interest to Mm -hmm. being a little bit more of a, uh, uh, I wanted to know, kind of a drive. I wanted to know more. And so I started reading as many encounter stories as I could and uh, started listening to podcasts a lot. I've, you know, between reading stories and listening, it's been thousands. Yeah. And um, I just never get tired of listening to <laughs> Bigfoot stories. <laughs> uh, yeah. But it's just, it's just fun. But what I learned from it was that there's so many cultures and language groups and eth- ethic, uh, ethnic groups throughout the whole world um, with different religions and different uh, la- languages, everything, just so many differences. And yet they're largely reporting the same, the same thing, the same mm-hmm. kind of phenomena re- associated with this creature, whether it be Yeti or Bigfoot or Sasquatch or, or wild man, or yeah. <laughs> there's just numerous uh, names for the, this thing. Every native American tribe has a noun just des- mm. describing the animal. So, um, and you just can't get people to agree on something <laughs> and have that much universal, universal, uh, nature to their, their encounter experiences. Mm. People just aren't like that. They don't agree easily <laughs> on things. And you, you couldn't get all those people from all those places to see the same thing and report the same thing unless they're really seeing it. Right. And so yeah, sure. with that much, and I, I just appreciate that as a historian, because we study uh, primary documents that has to be the, the basis of, of what all history is <clears throat> founded on. Uh, mm-hmm. You go from there to secondary documents, but you, there had, it has to be founded on a degree of, of primary documents. And <clears throat> those mm-hmm. can be oral documents like, uh, many of the documents are with Native Americans and people who don't have languages or necessarily are, were literate in the same sense that we are. Mm-hmm. Or they can be written documents. And we have both with the, with regard to this animal and this creature. And we have thousands of them, hundreds yeah. of thousands maybe, if you count them all up and if you could do that. Sure. And there's probably been millions of encounters <laughs> because one out of ten reports anything. Yeah, and uh, it's and, it's fascinating how uh, you know Bigfoot, especially how it grabs the attention of of a human uh, to where, and it's polarizing, as you said, where one person will be like, "This is definitely not a thing," and another person will be like, "Yeah, this is this has got to be something," you know. And we're uh, on this podcast, we're a little more on the this has got to be something because we like asking questions. We're a lot like you, you know, we're not necessarily historians, but we, we love history. We love, um, just digging in and just having information, just knowing I'm, I'm a very inquisitive person myself. So it is fascinating how Bigfoot, um, intrigues so many people. It's, it's very interesting. And, and they tend to be cool people. <laughs> yeah, I've met yeah. a lot of really cool people just since doing this book and doing podcasts. And it's been a very a great experience. And yeah. so I, I really enjoyed that. But they tend to be a little more open-minded. Uh, mm. They enjoy mystery. They tend to enjoy mystery. And, and I just mm. do. I, I like mysteries. I like things that make the world interesting. So. Yeah. That's kind of how I got involved in it. And then I gradually moved from thinking about this more in a, in a fact-based, logic-based, uh, uh, evidence-based, uh, non-fiction way to mm-hmm. looking to maybe to thinking maybe you could use fiction to draw people to this that would not be drawn to it maybe through non-fiction. Cause some people just, they just, don't care about the facts, you know? Sure, sure. Um, and someone told me, a wise person told me once that said, facts tell, but stories sell. Mm. So I thought, well, why don't we write some cool stories with some interesting people, characters, and throw this creature in there and make the story about how they react and respond to this mysterious creature and what it does to them as people and the emotions that they go through and the thinking Mm -hmm. that they go through. And then maybe that will 
spark someone's imagination and draw them into the into the mystery too and so that's kind of what i had in mind for better or for worse and i think to some degree it's working or to some degree it's it's working but very intelligent uh way to to go about it because you're right stories really bring out the the mystery as you were talking about everybody loves a good mystery everybody's listening to i mean if you look at all the top podcasts today they're all these murder mystery podcasts i mean that's yeah. that's what america is really listening to is is murder uh-huh. uh, but it, it's because it's a mystery it's something yeah. that they can dig into they like to yeah. follow the story and so that's a that's a very smart uh angle to take it really does um bring out the imagination for a person but but your you uh, have a little bit of a firsthand account, uh, not firsthand, but you, your brother is, is that uh, who had an encounter? Yeah. Well, I was, I had been thinking for a while about the, the nonfiction aspect. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry, the fiction aspect of this, but you know how you, I, it's, I'd never written a novel. So sure. I'm going, what do I know about writing a novel? <laughs> and um, so I just kept kind of putting it off and say, put, do oh, maybe another time. And then, I was with my brother about 10 years ago and we were helping my uncle out cleaning out his house. And, uh, I think something came on the TV about Bigfoot or, or, or I don't know, it could have been finding Bigfoot or something like that. So Mm. I asked him, uh, what's the strangest thing here or if he'd ever seen anything strange, um, Mm. that, that freaked him out or anything. And, and he started telling me this story and I couldn't believe it. And he, he had purchased some property in Mason County, Washington in the 90s, the early 90s, so he could build houses on it because he's a contractor. And he okay. he he was subdividing it, and, and he, he bought a house with the lots to the adjacent to it, and he was going to subdivide them and, and, and build houses on those, which he has done subsequently. But he... Uh, could only come on the weekends. He had to work in Seattle during the week, and then he'd come there on the weekends and do do his stuff to get ready for the to build. And he was there one weekend, and he he was having trouble with the trailer lights on his truck, and he ha- had to go out and fix them or do something to them. And he was out there, and it, and it was just um, maybe midday to to early evening. They're still mm-hmm. bit well lit, but it was becoming it's starting to get later dusk maybe and he starts smelling this really bad smell and Mm. and he couldn't figure out what it was and he thought maybe there was a dead animal or something um and so he started looking around and just to his left up the hill about 70 yards (laughs) this thing was standing there staring Mm. back at him and he he knows it was nine and a half to ten feet tall because its head came very close to a particular place on the pole the light the light pole. And he remembers that. Um, and, uh, his shoulders, he said were at least four and a half to five feet wide, which that was the part that scared him the most, not the tall, but how wide it was, how massive it was. And he freaked out. Um, when they realized they had made eye contact, it started screaming at him. Mm -hmm. Uh, and have you heard the videos of them screaming? And yeah, I have. Yeah, it's, pretty, it's a wild, crazy. weird noise. Yeah. And he said it's just like the this like that. It's really starts out. I think it starts out high and then it goes low, mm-hmm. and um and it just goes right through. He scared him. He said he he almost wet his pants. He it was that scared. Sure. Yeah, and he thought he thought it was coming after him. So he ran to the house and he grabbed his shotgun and closed the door and looked back out the window. He thought it would be on its way toward the house when he looked. And a 20-gauge shotgun wouldn't have helped him much. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, after he looked back out, it just finished screaming and then just hesitated for a while and then turned around and walked back in the woods away mm-hmm. from the house and down probably toward the area that he referred to as the tomato fields, which is why we called the book tomato fields. Wow. But <clears throat> that's the encounter he had. And he was very scared and he never wanted to tell anybody because he was so scared of being laughed at. So he just never did. And he told me, well, it would have been if it was in the early nineties, 
and we probably it was ten years ago, so it wasn't it was thirty year twenty years afterwards um, wow. when he finally told me. So it was, uh, but I'm glad he did because what that did to me was said, look, I got to do this. This mm. it kind of kicked me over the edge, and I just went back to the seventies because I wanted to write the book during a time when nobody had re- rarely heard the name Bigfoot, sure. where all of the popular stuff wasn't out there and, mm-hmm. and uh, all the research, they didn't have cell phones. I wanted to go back to a time before that. And mm-hmm. so I went back to the 70s, and the tomato fields was an area where they dumped raw sewage. They used to just dump the raw sewage in the fields with using trucks, and then that sewage would because of the seeds and human waste and, and other waste would grow vegetables mm-hmm. and, and the, uh, they became vegetables for acres. If you look on, I have a video on Instagram where he videotaped the tomato fields. They still exist in the process. He plants down there, but there's no more vegetables. It's all, it's just grass for mo- mm-hmm. for acres and acres. Wow. Um, but, uh, they he just referred to it as the tomato fields because there were so many vegetables and he thought that was a cool name and then he thought that was a cool name for the book so hmm. that kind of stuck we just stuck with that name and we wrote the book about that area so it's all related to fictional people in that area and his house is even the center of it so his address is in the book so what a cool uh, thing you know what but, a cool yeah, thing and it's worked out pretty well so yeah, and so you you had the ability for this book to actually tap into those emotions that you were talking about, yeah. how a person felt at the at the onset of you know coming into contact with one oh, of these yeah. beings because he had all that. I'm sure you know. I'm sure well, he had, he had all- it. He had it, and then I just like like I said, read thousands of stories. So mm-hmm. and or listened to, and mm-hmm. you just hear it enough. It just becomes second nature to to write about it because um, yeah. So, and I think I think I brought that out. I, people seem to like that. Yeah. So, so, so the book is being well received. Well, I'm getting good reviews. It's hard to market. Um, sure. I'm I'm. It's it's making some sales, but it's a dense it's dense out there, and it's hard oh, to penetrate yeah. and. So I'm trying to figure those things out, and I, I, I've heard the best way to sell one book is to write another one. Yeah. So and I'm you starting have plans out, for that. Yeah, I'm writing a sequel now to it. So, okay. and then when you have two, then they piggyback <laughs> off each other, and and I'll probably yeah. have to do something related to electronic media too. But sure. I just don't know what to do yet. I'm still learning a lot. It's a, a massive learning experience to just to publish a book now especially when you do it self-publishing yeah well, there's a lot of for... great tools but it's it's like it's like going to college just yeah just the publishing part not sure and then you consider the writing part and the marketing part it's it's a it's it's a massive <laughs> operation but i'm glad i did it because i learned a ton mm. um and it's been successful in a sense but not to the to the, you know, I can't say it's the best seller or anything like that. So sure. Well, hopefully, you know, you coming on here and going on to other podcasts, people will get uh, to hear your that's message what and, and, and what, what you're, yeah, that's why I'm hoping get the word yeah. out. No, that's awesome. And we, and we love Bigfoot around here, obviously, because we live in the Pacific Northwest and uh, we're all about live? Bigfoot. Where we live, live over by Eugene. Okay. You're Oregon then. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Yep. And so there's all kinds of, uh, you know, that stuff going Lots on around here. Yep. Lots of activity up in this area. And, you know, it's, it's hard to, to, uh, go very far without hearing somebody that has some kind of a story. And when you stack them up, as you were saying, when you yep. stack these stories up and you do like a detective and you start to look at all of the similarities and the things that, the things that make sense and the things that don't make sense, you, you tend to find that there's a lot more things that line up and make sense. Yeah. There's corroboration of, uh, of uh, information. Well, they, if you go to some areas in the Northwest, the rural areas, and you say there is no Bigfoot, mm-hmm. they roll their eyes at you. <laughs> yeah. But you go to areas in the cities and you say there's no, you, there is Bigfoot, they roll your eyes at you there. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, and it's because they just enough people have seen them and encountered them. They just they're not going to argue with you, but they're not, they're also not going to listen to you. Yeah. So, so I get a lot of people asking me, and maybe you'll have a better answer than I, because it does sound like you've done the ten thousand hours of research and everything like that. But uh, what is your take on Bigfoot, and 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 what is it? Do you, what do you think this this cryptid could be? Well, I have thought a lot about that, and I don't, I can't give you a perfect answer. But if I had to bet money on it. I would think it has some kind of extraterrestrial basis. Okay. And and the reason I think that is because it doesn't seem to uh, fit the physical laws on this planet. Mm -hmm. It seems to be faster than something that size should be, uh, jump higher than something that size should be able to jump, climb faster than, you know, um, and and maybe even do mysterious things like just disappear completely, you know. We, mm -hmm. um, but it 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 makes makes me think of you know how Superman when he has crypt, kryptonite he's not very strong and yeah there was kryptonite on his planet that balanced his strength so mm -hmm. he 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 kind of brought him down to earth so to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, I just wonder if these things developed originally on another planet. And then we're introduced to this planet somehow in some way. Mm -hmm. And then maybe the gravity was stronger on those on that planet and they got sure. stronger and needed to be stronger to do simpler things, easier things mm -hmm. uh, that they are find very easy here. And then because of that, they just can jump out of the gym, uh, yeah. you know, and they are amazingly athletic. And, but mm -hmm. they move in ways that people and things shouldn't move, that animals on this planet don't move. And yeah. they do things that the animals don't do. So I just think that if I had to bet money on it, you know, I would, I would think it's extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. And that opens up the doors for a lot of other things because paranormal, a lot of people call that woo the paranormal mm -hmm. woo stuff. And I think that's a little bit of a cop out and, or oversimplification because paranormal is just beyond normal. It's mm -hmm. just beyond what we understand now. It sure. doesn't mean that it's not possible or that it's not even not probable. It's mm -hmm. just not accessible. Now it doesn't make sense to us based on what we know now, but uh, 500 years ago, a lot of things wouldn't made sense to uh, them either. And mm -hmm. so it could, it could be that in a hundred years, it'll go, Oh yeah, duh. <laughs> that was sure. the deal. That's what was going on all the time. And I think when we know more about what's out there <laughs> and, and the massive nature of the universe that we live in, which is just staggeringly big, it's mm -hmm. billions of galaxies with billions of stars and trillions of planets over a vast area. Um, that we're just not living in an earth centric universe <laughs> and that there's a lot of there's pro there has to be and just mathematically there has to be other life in the universe and mm -hmm. um i think that when we know more i have a better picture of what that is like the bigfoot thing will just make sense it won't it'll go oh duh, yeah that that explains the whole thing and everyone will just take it for granted then Sure. The things they discount now are often discount because we don't really know what our place is in this universe. All we can really do is guess mm. um, until we start, unless there are parts of our government or something that know and just don't want to tell us. I, I just, yeah. I don't believe much about what I hear anymore. So from, from government. So, yeah. but I do believe there's more to this universe than what we know. And when we know more of what it is, I think we'll understand some of the smaller micro mysteries more. And mm -hmm. Bigfoot's one of those smaller micro mysteries, I think. Sure. And that's a great point, you know, because there, when you know a little bit of information about something, you can be pretty dangerous. But when you, when you've done like you've done and you've looked at things for a very long time and you're able to categorize and be able to, because, 
that's what I always find. And I've said this very recently on another podcast is when, when you go up to talk to people or, or if somebody approaches you like, Oh, you're that Bigfoot guy, you know, it, it, it's, it's like they can shut you down so quickly without doing any research. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's upsetting in, in a way because you're like, well, I, have, you know, this body of evidence, as I said in that last podcast, that that is extending long past this conversation, obviously, because I've done lots of research. And so when they uh, when a when a person just discounts lots of things, right, anything without doing their due diligence and digging in and doing the research as you have done, it, it really doesn't, you know, merit much of a com of a conversation or an argument if you Absolutely. just say that's not true it, like that doesn't merit an argument at all i've stopped doing it i've yeah. i uh if you've heard the saying don't throw your pearls before swine oh yeah mm -hmm. they just trample it under feet and sure. and i'm not calling them names when i say that if people don't believe that's fine with me but um what i don't do is waste time Mm -hmm. discussing it just to have perfectly reasonable evidence discounted. So yeah. what what I'll do if I, for some of my family, I just don't even bring it up anymore because yeah, it's, it's, sure. it's just a waste of time. And yeah. it just, it's just not going to go anywhere. And then if I run into someone that I think, well, there might be something here, I'll ask them, have you ever seen anything just that was really hard to explain or strange or weird? you know, mm -hmm. um, in the woods, like kind of like what I did with Joe. And sure. if they say no, or the strangest thing they ever saw was a bear, a bear. Cool. I leave it there. I don't push it because yeah. yeah. I, I just don't want to be discounted, mm -hmm. um, or, or dismissed, you mm -hmm. know, because they don't have any interest or care or they think you're silly. Yeah. So, that's kind of how I've got where I've come to this thing. And I really don't care if it's ever solved. I like it that it's a mystery. Yeah. I like the, I like it. I, if they find one or if they're able to prove something great, I'll be happy about that. If not, I'll, I don't care. I know they exist and I know yeah. that it's a real thing and it's a um, fascinating thing. And uh, I wish people would be more less naive because I think they're also at times dangerous things. <laughs> I mean, imagine if people thought there were no grizzlies in Yellowstone. Right. And every time you said, no, there are, there, there's these really big animals and they have long teeth and they have sharp claws. And sometimes they're, they get angry and dangerous. No, yeah. you're an idiot. What do you mean? There's nothing like that. If, yeah. I think that would be a pretty dangerous situation to put people into. Yeah, well, and and if I, you if you've scared any animal in your life, they they tend to usually react with with violence, uh, and, and it's not because that they're angry; it's because that they're scared. You're just and scared. so, imagine walking in on a Bigfoot that you yeah. scare. You know, but it's going to react. Why do we say grizzly bears exist? Mm -hmm. But we because it's obvious it would be silly to run around Yellowstone and and not know that's a possibility. But we mm -hmm. won't say Bigfoot. Yeah. Either. Yeah, it's really, really interesting. Um, so you were a teacher uh, for a long time. You're doing some administrative stuff now, but you're yeah. you were a teacher for a long time, a history teacher. Yeah, I've I've been a history teacher a long time. So, did you ever have these? I'm just curious. Did you ever have these discussions with your students and, and yeah, and talk little about little, stuff? little ones? Yeah, yeah. And I do the same with them. I don't I don't force the issue. If they ask me questions, I answer them, and yeah. that's all I do is answer that question. And yeah. if it leads to other questions, then I'll answer that question. <laughs> yeah. And they, some fun. of them get a kick out of it and laugh at me. And some of them think they they like, might really agree with me. But yeah. what I don't do is put my ego on the line and try to win oh, sure. the kids to something. I don't think it matters if people believe in it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, it be. Yeah. I think it it's it's a true thing. Mm -hmm. And it's good to know the truth about things and be curious. But. I'm, I don't have an axe to grind. I don't have yeah. so, but the, and the kids appreciate that and they respect. They like that I wrote a book. Yeah, I bet. there's there's a few of them in the library. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> they, fun. They so, but they, um, but but I don't know what they think. Some of them sure. text text me or or yeah. uh, insta Instagram me with 
funny pictures or send me videos of Bigfoot sure. and ask me what I think. So that's funny. that's funny. Yeah, I, I was just interested. I get like I said, I'm a, I'm interested in everything. <laughs> yeah, good. So you uh, you wrote this book. How long did it take you to write? Well, it, from start to finish, about ten years. Wow. Because I like I said, I'd never done it, and I had sure. a lot of. You know, when you've never done anything, it's not you can't find a lot of people who who will wonder why who won't wonder why you're doing this. Yeah, <laughs> you've, never, you've never written a novel. My wife said you hardly read novels, and you're going to write one. Yeah. So, so I said, but anyway, and so I had most of I had to just mostly grind through it, and then mm. when I'd find someone interested, I'd kind of try to get their opinion on what they thought. And I got some encouraging comments. Um, so I just kept going. And then um, uh, I had a reco uh, uh, recovery experience um, related to alcoholism um, mm. about five and a half years ago. And I had a, uh, I, I've had a num couple of spiritual experiences in my life. And uh, one of them was in college when I became a Christian. And then uh, this one I had. Uh, much later, in uh, later adulthood, when I had experienced recovery from uh, addiction, alcoholism, and okay. I, uh, I, as part of that, I realized I have to finish this. Uh, that I have, to, I have things I need to do and related to writing, and I have mm -hmm. to finish this book to as something that I completed. You know, it's part of a reco recovery experience because it because I often had great ideas, you know, and uh, could start things really good. But following through and finishing, that's another story. And sure. part of me, part of my recovery was following through and finishing things mm -hmm. and and then making that a pattern and habit in my life. And one of those things was this book. And so about. Three years ago, I really kicked started on this thing. I'd, I'd had about two thirds of it written, but I really went forward and finished the rest of the book, and then did some editing, and then got some other people to do some editing, and then learned how to self publish. So it's been the last three to four years have been the most active part of that, mm -hmm. and the most motivated part of that, and partially because of the the desire to follow through on things and that's been a great thing for me that's yeah. been even more it just knowing that you can start something and finish it and be have some decent results as a as a as a uh, result mm -hmm. it it builds confidence in you even if you don't make a bunch of money and you know, have be a bestseller, whatever that means. I don't even know what that means anymore because there's so many <laughs> bestseller awards. So, but so yes, it's been really good, and it really got energized about three and a half to four years ago, and so that's that's kind of how it all took place. So it was a product of a lot of things. The book yeah. was a product of a lot of things. It's quite a journey. And, and you know, when, when you learn that lesson in life, which is hard for all of us, right, to finish strong, uh, it, it really transforms everything in your life because you're finishing, you know, at home with your, with your family, you're finishing at work, you're doing all of the things that might have not, you know, been finished before. And you learn that then Paul says, you, you got to learn how to finish the race. You got to finish strong this, this thing that God has started in us. And, uh, then you really begin to <laughs> learn how important it is to finish strong. And so it's awesome, uh, testimony that, cause that is one thing that, you know, I'll admit I've struggled with and I know a lot of people do. So, well, it's not, it's not uncommon and it's mm -hmm. nothing to be ashamed of. Sure. And I, uh, I had an, an, a spiritual experience that deepened and broadened and strengthened. I mean, it forced me to reconcile the other experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, well, the first one was really uh, an evangelical experience, charismatic experience, but it was it it was still an uh, um, 
I don't want to step on toes, but it, it was pretty Protestant. <laughs> okay. And, yeah. and sure. I have moved a little bit into other directions now because of my uh, greater appreciation for mystery and a sense that I'm one with God and, and, and more of a non-dual approach to Christianity. And uh, I don't see, I, I don't see God over there and me over here and me trying to get to him, you know, mm -hmm. and even though Protestants say it's saved by grace through faith and you can't do anything for your salvation, they still, it always acts like we've got to chase after God and, He's over sure. there, and we're over here, and sure. and that's not even in their theology. That's not true. God is everywhere. We're somewhere, so He's always surrounding us, regardless. And um, so I've started to learn to look at God as more of a non-dual. That's how they would call it in the East: a non-dual, always connected. And our problem isn't that we're not connected or we're separated from God. The problem is we're mentally separated from God. Our minds. Mm -hmm are separated and we're focusing in on the things of this world to give us the satisfaction inside instead of focusing on the things inside to fix the things outside. And I yeah. spent a lot of time spiritualizing my ego mm -hmm. and making myself look like I'm supposed to look because I, because I felt like a hypocrite, but yeah. I wasn't really letting go of those things that were preventing me from being free. And, sure. and, um, and then I learned how to spiritualize them, which is just the worst thing you can do. And mm -hmm. so I don't care anymore. I, I don't, I don't, I am who I am. Uh, I, I know that, uh, that God is always with me and I am always in him. Just like yeah. if you're in an ocean, in a boat, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to go where the ocean goes. <laughs> <laughs> you're yeah. not going to have to go where i got to find the ocean. You're not going to say, well, well, <laughs> yeah. what am I going to do if I can't find the ocean? You're in the ocean. And, yeah. and when I, if I stand on the beach, put my feet in the water, but still have my feet in the ground and complain that the ocean's not doing anything to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's because I still have my feet on the ground. I've never gotten in the water. I never got a, 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 a outside of my ability to yeah, control the, the control. water. If you want mm -hmm. to, if you want to be in God, if you want to do and be changed by God, you got to jump in mm -hmm. and get in the water and yeah. let the water take you where it wants you to go, not where you want to go. Sure. And, and that's when you start feeling the, 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 power of god i think yeah and so that's kind of how i look at it differently than i did and that's kind of how i've reconciled things so and it's it such fits a right in point. with the scriptures it fits right in yeah. with the scriptures but it's a different way of looking at it even mm -hmm. today or yesterday one of the administrators was talking and sharing about horizontal and vertical and she was sharing all these things, and I was almost part about Christ being horizontal, and we're always trying to get to him. And I said, why do you get to him if you're either with him or you're not with him? Yeah. Why do you have to get to him? And I was, my heart was kind of, she wasn't saying anything wrong, you know, right. and it was like, oh, right, in the Bible. But if you read the Bible, you can read interpretation into it. You know, mm -hmm. you just have assumptions going in, and then it all makes sense and revolves around those assumptions and i just was thinking why can't he just be with us all the time why can't we just be with him all the time why do we have to chase after him he's not running no. from us <laughs> no so well in fact so, it's yeah. funny because in Gen in genesis you know when because i've heard it said many times in protestant churches that that it that our sin separated us from yeah. god and it was jesus that built a bridge to bring us back to yeah. him nice. and and i get that I get that understanding, but the, the problem with that is, is when they did what they did in the garden, Jesus, or I'm sorry, <laughs> probably Jesus, but God was walking in the garden as a man walking to them to find them. And so don't tell me, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be rude or step on anybody's toes. As you said, don't tell me that our sin separates no. us from God because God was looking for them after the and, sin. And he still he was is pursuing them. Yeah. He still, he still loves us. Yeah. It's he, the continued pursuit. It's absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the only sin that separates us 
from God is an unbelief hmm. and pride that, that we got this. We don't really need you anymore. So you stay on over there. and We're going to take over this over here and we're going to take. And but it doesn't separate us from God. It separates us, our consciousness from God. We became we become world conscious and not God mm -hmm. conscious because he's always there. Even when we're the most distant mentally from him, you're still surrounded by him. It's like being, yeah. being in the water and thinking you're not getting wet, you know, yeah. it's just um, so. But so I agree with you. I don't think that's an ever situation where you're being distanced or separated. You we alienate ourselves and we do it mm -hmm. with our thinking. Yes. And, and he never does it to us. And he's a loving God. And yeah. that's changed a lot of my certain doctrinal things that I've come to believe in. Yeah. And because uh, I see God as a loving, always a loving God. And he's all loving. He's all mm -hmm. powerful. He's all knowing. He's ever present. Mm -hmm. He's all of those things. And mm -hmm. he knows how to treat his children and give good things to his children. Yeah. And he doesn't want to see, see, Anyway, I just don't agree, believe the things that a lot of things I used to just assume and take for yeah. granted. And they you affected have to, how I looked at all these other things that I would read. Sure. You so, have to take the Bible and, and, and read it for yourself. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people will, and we've talked about this on the podcast before, they'll, they'll stand up. Um, on a pulpit and they'll tell us what, what the Bible says. And then, you know, people don't go home and check that. They don't, yeah. they don't, I, I don't say nobody. Obviously, there's a lot of people that do, but there's a large majority, I believe, of Christians and I've met them. I know who they are. Like, I'm not trying to damage people's too. ego. I'm just trying to help people understand that we have to read our own Bibles. Like, this is a message that we have to dig into. That's part of like when, when people talk about baptism and it being an outward, um, show for everybody else to see that you are a Christian and you've made this declaration now to everybody. I'm just like, you can make a declaration by, by reading your Bible by actually getting to know God, by, by, by showing everyone every day your relationship with God and how that looks. But not, not to show them, hmm. <laughs> but to just be with God, yeah. to, just, to just be in Him and, and enjoy every day, getting Him going, wow, I get another day. <laughs> this is yeah. another opportunity to, to serve, to, to do uh, His will, and to trust him and to live with that trust and to sense that excitement and wow, another time. Wow. I can't believe that happened. You know, and you can have those little miracles happening all the time. Sure. Um, but it takes some trust. Faith should is trust. It's not just some really? abstract belief in something. It's trust. Yeah. And that's the difference between someone who trusts God and someone who doesn't. So sure. Yeah, so wh where can people find your book? Do you have it on, it's on uh, Amazon. Do you have a website? It's on, it's on Amazon. Amazon. Um, okay. I have. Um, I'm, I do a lot with Instagram and, and a little bit with Twitter, and um, I also am going to have a website, but uh, you just have to do that right. If you don't do yeah. it right, you do it wrong, and then it doesn't <laughs> help you much. So, and I'm and you do learn, it again. I'm, ha I'm having to learn that. So, but. Yeah. But you can get the book easy just by typing in Tomato Fields on Amazon or Tomato Fields and my name, Tim Moon, just like the moon in the sky. And and it'll come right up probably on a Google search, but it'll certainly come up in an Amazon search. And then it's available through um, a paperback. It's available on electronic version. And it's also you can read it if you're part of Kindle University which mm -hmm. allows you to read book. You'd pay like seven, eight bucks a month, and then you can read books yeah. as much as you want. So you can also uh, read it there. So, Well, let's talk about this new book. Is it going to be kind of following in the same line of yeah, the I'm, first I'm, one? I'm, yeah, I'm going to do it about, though, looks like the big thicket area down here in Texas because there's a okay. lot of weird stuff down here. Um, a yeah. lot of lights and UFO sightings and uh, yeah. they call him wild man down here, wild man sightings and a lot of disappearances, weird disappearances in the national forest. And 
Mm-hmm. There's a lot of national forests and parks and preserves down here that you wouldn't think in Texas, but the, the Sam Houston National Forest, the Davy Crockett National Forest, and the mm-hmm. Big Thicket Preserve. And so I would like to center it, set it down here to draw on a character or two from the other book and mm. add some new characters and some new drama. And, um, and then maybe introduce some more paranormal elements to it, like portals and uh, yeah. lights. You know, there's oftentimes these orb type lights follow mm. or at least are indirectly uh, connected with these animals. And that's showing up more and more. So, I'd kind of like to explore that part of it too, in addition to uh, continuing with the Bigfoot. Well, that's so awesome. And we're so looking forward to uh, that next book. I know that uh, I haven't read your book yet, but I I have it coming (laughs) because I'm super fascinated about Bigfoot and about uh, this story. It sounds like a great read. Can I I just say, make one uh, thing. I, um, I, was was having my book edited by somebody who I knew, and mm-hmm. she, uh, about uh, three quarters of the way through, she calls me and tells me she can't do it anymore because she says I'm my characters are using guns unsafely. Okay. So I uh, yeah. I said then she said I'm going to rewrite parts of it so that you could see how I would accept it if I was, and I said, so I wasn't going there. I, I removed all the rewritten stuff and then I had to edit, finish all the editing myself. And cause I was yeah. on a, t- on a deadline and sure. I am not, that's not my strong, the editing part is not my strong. So I've had to go back in twice and edit, and it still wasn't good enough for me. So I am, I have someone editing it right now and I'm going to upload those edits within the next two to three weeks. Okay. And so if those, if it, the typos here and there bother you, uh, please uh, know that I'm working hard to fix that. And it's sure. just, it's a massive undertaking to publish yeah. a book and, and it takes a team of people with different skills. And I just, that was one that I wasn't, um, the best at I can do it, sure. but I'm just not the best at it. I, I like the writing and the content part of it and the storytelling. So what I'm seeing in reviews is a plus on the story and the character development and the pacing, the things that really are important, but yeah. not an a plus on the editing. And so, sure. but that will be an a plus soon. Okay. So yeah. I just, I just want everyone to know if they do read it and they, that, that, bothers them a little it's the 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 calvary's on the way okay yeah and well and i hope that our our audience would be very gracious in that way we know okay you know and and i know that you know when you take obviously we we started this podcast from nothing about right. six months ago and it's blowing up you know so we're very um aware of the the mistakes that we make and all of those things so we uh we hope that uh, our audience will will get your book and they'll read through it because it it is fascinating the whole understanding of bigfoot and even if you don't know much about bigfoot pick up the book uh you'll probably learn a lot about bigfoot just by reading through and one of the things i try to do is is um not take a stand I, I would like you to, if you are really into the paranormal side of this and you send, tend to think that's that's what this is all about, then there's going to be a place for you to be in this book. And if you're in the flesh and blood and you think that woo-woo stuff, is, um, you're, you're going to be able to reconcile that with, with that. Um, and if you're somewhere in the middle like me, you'll that'll work too. I wanted to allow people to, to just be who they were when they read the book and find what they're looking for. And uh, also maybe challenge a little bit, you know, yeah. with regard to that. But that was a hope. I'm, and I think I did, I think I did a pretty good job with that. So anyway, well, I will let you know, I'm going to okay. read it and I will let you know, I'll give you some feedback and uh, I'm sure it'll all be positive. And reviews are great. Great things. Reviews yeah. are easy to leave and they're, they're really helpful for writers. If, well, sure. you know that because you get reviews on your podcast, right? 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's super helpful if you guys don't mind, you know, even if you, uh, if you've already read the book or, and, and haven't reviewed it, it'd be awesome if you could go and, uh, review that for him on Amazon so that others can just know what, what you thought of the book and, and it helps people find them. We've talked about algorithms and all that. So people know yeah. that, uh, we gotta, we gotta work those algorithms. So please support yep. Tim. Uh, he's a, a great guy. As you've heard, uh, the book again is Tomato Fields. Uh, and, Tim, do you have anything else before we uh, sign off for this episode? No, uh, just that if you if um, I'm going to be going out with some guys who are pretty serious about this and they go to some hairy places <laughs> in the big thicket, it's a very strange place. And yeah, um, uh, so when I do, um, I'm going to do some recording out there and maybe uh, I can connect with you and maybe some yeah. other people and share some of the stuff that's going on. So. If you're interested, fantastic. I'd be glad to do that because um, it's gonna it's gonna be interesting. I think so. Oh yeah, we would love that. Let us know, and uh, we'll get you back on. It would be fun. okay. I'll, I'll I will stay in touch. Okay. All right, so, my sure, friend. It was sure, so great uh, to meet you. Sure, thankful for the opportunity to be on your show. It's been a pleasure, and I hope that that people like it and that you get good results from it. But. Um, I just appreciate the opportunity. So thank you. Of course. Thank you, Tim. Uh, okay. Guys, look out his book, Tomato Fields, and we will catch you guys on the next one. Bye, Tim. Thanks okay. again. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Bye.